Okay, uh, then welcome back to effective field theory. Last week we did a lot of exercises and in the week before in our lecture we began with discussing what effective field theories actually are and how <coughs> they work and how they can be constructed. In short, effective field theories provide for us low energy approximation of some fundamental or a full theory which works at higher energy scale. And the effective field theory provides approximations as Taylor expansions in a small ratio of small energies and masses uh, divided by heavy masses of some heavy particles, which can be integrated out and which do not appear in the effective flow energy uh, theory. In the lecture and in the exercises, we uh, did actually four types of calculations and today I want to summarize what we did so far and draw some important general lessons from our exercises which will be valid for the rest of the semester. Let us begin with two lessons from the exercise uh, and also from the lecture. Lesson one. On the actual existence of effective field theories and how they can be constructed. So first of all, we have seen in our examples that effective field theories exist. This is the first non-trivial statement, obviously, and uh, uh, we know they exist because we have explicitly constructed them, and we have constructed them in two different ways. What are the two ways we have used to construct effective field theories? The first way was to calculate Feynman diagrams in the full theory with propagators of hard particles and then to expand the Feynman diagrams and match them to Feynman diagrams of an effective field theory Lagrangian. Basically, you can do an ansatz for an effective field theory Lagrangian and adjust the terms in the Lagrangian until the effective field theory Feynman diagrams provide a correct approximation to the diagrams of the full theory and we have worked out explicitly how that can be done and by observation it works and therefore the effective field theory exists. There was however a second way which uh, sounds a little bit more general and also provides a reason why the first step works, namely by using equations of motion. By using equations of motion, we can integrate out, as it is the jargon, um, the heavy particles. And in our cases, this integration uh, works by using the equations of motion of the heavy fields in the full theory and uh, by plugging in the solution to the classical equation of motion for the heavy field into the Lagrangian, then the heavy field doesn't exist anymore. It has been replaced by some functional of the light field and in this way we obtain a Lagrangian which just depends on the light field. And uh, we have seen explicitly in several cases that the two procedures end up with the same result and therefore we know that we have two ways to construct effective field theories. Let me stress from the outset that the first uh, way matching Feynman diagrams always works and the second is specific to our three level discussion and we will see the reason why that is. So that is the first lesson, effective field theories exist and can be constructed in two different ways. The second lesson is about the ambiguity in the effective field theories because we have also seen and uh, again in two different ways that the Lagrangian of the effective field theory has some redundancy and uh, that corresponds to an ambiguity. For describing physical observables and uh, this has again been checked 
in two ways. Namely, the first way we have observed this ambiguity was um, by explicitly computing observables using different versions of the effective field theory and obtaining the same result. So, explicit computation of observables. and obtaining the same result. And we have done this in two different exercises uh, in numbers. It was exercise number two and also exercise number four, which is a generalization of exercise number two. And we have only sketched the solution of this exercise number two, but there uh, this involves a very elaborate computation of observables, uh, which involve such a redundancy. The second way how to see this ambiguity is to apply field redefinitions or field transformations. On to L, on to the Lagrangian. And uh, if we know or uh, use the statement that field transformations are unphysical and therefore cannot change the physical content of the theory, it is clear that by applying a field transformation, we go from one Lagrangian to another one which looks different but describes the same physics. And uh, again, we have done this in two ways in exercise number two, which is very simple and concretely given field transformation, and in exercise number four with a generalization. Okay, so these are the four different types of calculations that we did, twice with two equal results, and uh, therefore we have already learned uh, many very important details about effective field theories. And now I want to expand a little bit on that. First of all, let me give you a more detailed summary of um, the first type of lesson we have already done the computation of matching Feynman diagrams for one example, and let me sketch a little bit uh, more general case. And uh, later on, we will then give the proof why uh, this uh, equation of motion method actually works, and this will then, of course, also establish in general why effective field theories exist. Second, I also want to expand a little bit on exercise number four, which we have all only sketched in the exercise class, but uh, let me give you a few more details on the solution. So, next section, let me give you a detailed summary of the construction of effective field theories, uh, which works in two ways. So, and I will go back to the example of our section 1.1 of the lecture. And uh, this was similar to exercise uh, on exercise sheet number two and exercise number three. But let's concretely work with our full theory of the lecture, which is this one. Let's write it down. So a normal kinetic and mass term for a light field, a normal kinetic and mass term for a heavy field, a potential which we don't specify any more detailed for the light field only, and interactions involving the heavy field, uh, 1L, 2Hs, 2L, 1H, and 3Hs. And we have uh, explicitly worked out the Feynman rules for the theory and computed some Feynman diagrams. And let me now sketch 
and summarize what has happened. So first, we have computed processes such as 2L scattering going into 2Ls. So we have done that in our section 1.1 and it involved Feynman diagrams which look, for example, like this, where two light and two light in the initial and final state connected by a heavy line and then we can do a Taylor expansion of the propagator of the heavy line and express it in terms of an EFT Feynman rule. But then we have went on and in the exercise we have considered a process with five L's. So that was exercise. Um, and uh, okay, there are different types of Feynman diagrams. One Feynman diagram looked like this. So here, two heavy lines in intermediate states, two L's in the initial state and three L's in the final state. And there are many examples of further Feynman diagrams. And one could also calculate processes with six L's and so on. For six L's, it could look, for example, like this. Two L's in the initial state. Then using the triple vertex with three heavy particles and four particles in the final state and so on. So we can compute all these Feynman diagrams and for each one we can do a Taylor expansion in one over the heavy mass scale. And then we obtain the following as a Taylor expansion in pi square over capital M square. This is completely described by an effective field theory. L effective is the same kinetic term and the same mass term for the light field. Then this light original potential and then additional terms which are now different from the second line in the full theory. So now there come interactions involving only the light fields but not the heavy field. And so after some calculation, it looks like this, plus lambda two divided by capital M square times three over four factorial L to the fourth power plus one over eight L square minus D'Alembert divided by capital M square acting on L square and uh, plus some other terms and let me write just one term that we have found minus with an unknown prefactor lambda two square times lambda one divided by M to the fourth power times L to the fifth. So this is what we found and uh, with some work we can uh, work out many additional terms and we can work out all the exact prefactors of the terms in the Lagrangian by requiring that the Feynman rules from here reproduce the Feynman diagrams over there. Now, this is the first way how we can construct effective field theories which we have applied several times and let me now uh, summarize the second way namely using equations of motion. So use the equation of motion for the heavy field H. And so we have already the last time worked out how the equation of motion looks like. So let me copy it. D'Alembert H plus capital M square H is equal to minus lambda one LH minus lambda two over two L square minus lambda three over two times H square. And in this equation of motion, we now have to say that all the energies uh, are small and the only, um, so every term is of dimension three and the biggest term is M square times H. So therefore this is dominant 
And on the other hand, here on the right hand side, there is one single term which does not depend on capital H. And so we can iteratively solve the equation of motion as a Taylor expansion in 1 over m square. So I just solve uh, for this term here and divide by capital M square, then I get h is equal to 1 over m square times the following. And let me start with the h independent term, so minus lambda 2 over 2 capital uh, small l square, then plus all the other terms, so minus d'Alembert h minus lambda 1 l h minus lambda 3 over 2 h square. And then since we see that capital H is suppressed as 1 over capital M square, it is small by construction. And therefore, the procedure is to uh, plug in the same solution for the equation of motion once again into all the H's which appear here on the right hand side. And then we get terms which are of the order 1 over M to the fourth, 1 over M to the sixth, and so on. So here we would iterate the same equation. And in this way, we obtain a Taylor expansion in 1 over capital M square on the, on the right hand side at any given order in 1 over M square, only L appears and not H anymore. Then in this procedure, we would plug the solution here into the original Lagrangian. We plug it into the full theory and Concretely, if we do it, we obtain the following in this particular case. So H is replaced by the solution H of the equation of motion. We get 1 over 2 dl squared, the kinetic term, minus the mass term, minus the original potential. And then um, we get one term plus lambda 2 squared divided by 8 capital M squared times L to the fourth minus lambda 2 squared lambda 1 divided by 4 M to the fourth L to the fifth minus lambda 3 lambda 2 cube over 12 times 8 m to the 6, l to the 6, minus lambda 2 square divided by 8, m to the 4, l square, d'Alembert, l square, plus and so on. And let me just explain where a few of those terms come from. For example, let us look at the first term that I wrote, the l to the 4 term. Where does it come from? It comes from two origins. If we take the solution here, h at lowest non-vanishing order, h is just given by lambda 2 over 2 L squared divided by capital M squared. So let's just take this simple solution for capital H, and then we plug in the solution here, uh, sorry, here and here, in both places. In both places, if we plug in that solution, we get a term of the order lambda 2 square. We get exactly such a term, lambda 2 square divided by capital M square. And the prefactor coming from here is minus 1 over 4, uh, or 1 over 8. And here, the prefactor from here uh, is um, 1 over 4. And in combination, it gives plus 1 over 8 prefactor. So just as an example. This comes from the m square over 2 h square minus lambda 2 over 2 l square h terms. And similarly, all the other terms arise if you plug in the same solution into all the other terms in the Lagrangian. So, and the important observation that we have made is that the result is the same. The Lagrangian that we have written down here, obtained from the equation of motion, is the same as the Lagrangian we obtained here from matching Feynman diagrams. That is the big 
important observation. Okay, so this is the lesson one. We can construct effective field theories in two different ways with twice the same result. Any questions to this? Where, sorry, where are you yes, looking? Uh, oh, okay, maybe a misprint. In the uh, lecture we did that, so you can check your notes. And uh, looking at the diagram, of course, it must be lambda two square, so I uh, would imagine that uh, last time when we did the actual calculation, we also did it correctly. Any other questions? Okay, so that is the first lesson. Let us then discuss the second lesson on the ambiguity. Okay, let us discuss some details on the ambiguities in effective field theories. And uh, we use as a concrete example the exercise number four from the second exercise sheet. We sketched uh, kind of the solution and uh, the procedure in the exercise class already. But let me now uh, summarize in a little bit more detail what needs to be done. But uh, the summary issue is really meant um, in conjunction with the notes that I provided you on the Selma page. So please work through the notes um, later on, um, comparing with the summary that I provide here. I will give you the main uh, items that you need to think about and also the essential solutions of intermediate steps. Um, and of course, the lessons that we can learn from it. So, that is an effective field theory for a light field small l with discrete symmetry. L goes to plus or minus l. That simply means we have only even powers of l in the Lagrangian. And uh, the exercise illustrates three items. The first one is we need to construct the most general versus the simplest effective field theory Lagrangian up to dimension six operators. So the first task of the exercise is particularly to construct the most general Lagrangian that is at all possible and then contrast it to the simplest Lagrangian. The second is then to compute observables. Simply compute all relevant observables in the most general case and of course also in the simplest case, which is a specialization. Once you have computed the observables, you observe redundancies. Redundancies mean that the observables do not depend on all parameters separately, but only very specific combinations of parameters actually play a role in the prediction of observables. That is a redundancy. And the third point is to eliminate the redundancies by 
by field transformations. without changing physics. So the logic here is that we know, we put in here the knowledge that field transformations cannot change physics. We know that to begin with, then we apply certain field transformations and we observe that in this way we uh, um, recover exactly the same redundancies that we have observed before in the explicit computations. So we get a consistent analysis of the redundant quantities in our theory. So we have two ways to analyze the redundancies and the second way in particular is then the technical way to eliminate the redundancies by applying field, if you start out with a general Lagrangian, you apply field transformations and go to the simpler but equivalent Lagrangian uh, where you know from the beginning that the observables will come out the same, but you do not need to go through the computation of the observables in the general case because that is, of course, excessively complicated. And the point of the exercise is to really go through this excessively complicated computation of observables in the fully general case with all these uh, unnecessary parameters in the Lagrangian and see that despite all the unnecessary complexities, you get the same result. And as a byproduct, um, this complicated calculation teaches you some um, basic quantum field theory, namely it gives illustration of the LSE reduction for the S matrix and related quantities. But let's go through it step by step. The first point, let us discuss a little bit the general operator basis. How do you get the most general Lagrangian, so um, let me define a reference Lagrangian which is the simplest Lagrangian for this effective field theory. I call it uh, M reference for the mass term minus lambda reference over four factorial L to the four minus C1 reference L to the six. And, uh, from some other exercise, we know that this Lagrangian is sufficient. It contains the fully general um, terms which are necessary to describe physics at the dimension six level of this theory. So there are three physical parameters, the mass, the quartic coupling, and the six order coupling. Let us contrast this with the general Lagrangian and maybe uh, yeah, let me give you the result immediately. So the general Lagrangian contains here a free coefficient in the kinetic term. So the kinetic term is not canonically normalized, but it has an arbitrary prefactor A1. Then the mass term, I redefined it compared to the exercise sheet. So I call it A1 times M tilde, uh, however you call it the mass term has an arbitrary coefficient. Then there is some lambda without index times L to the four. And there are three dimension six operators, namely minus C1 times L to the six, minus C2 times L cube d'Alembert L, minus C3 L d'Alembert square L. So here we have the squared D'Alembert operator, in other words, a fourth derivative. And here has gone into an analysis that we did in the exercise, namely the most general basis of dimension six operators up to total derivatives. Contains the three operators L to the six, L cube, d'Alembert L, and L d'Alembert square L. And we did the analysis in the exercise, so let me not repeat it here. 
So in our general ansatz for the Lagrangian, we have six free parameters. In the specific one, we have three parameters. And uh, the outcome of the analysis will be that the physics described by both is the same. That means three out of the six parameters are actually redundant. They do not influence physical observables. They only influence unphysical quantities, such as green functions, uh, expectation values of the field operators, but not physical quantities. Let me specify the Feynman rules. The Feynman rules, first of all, are for the propagator of the theory. The propagator of the theory in the reference case, so the simple case is simply I divided by P square minus M reference square, the usual propagator Feynman rule. But in this general theory, we have the additional normalization A1 in front of the kinetic term and as you hopefully know, the simple rule for the propagator is that it is simply the inverse of the uh, kinetic term in the, or of the differential operator of the bilinear term in the Lagrangian in momentum space. So here we get I divided by A1 times P square minus M tilde square. So the A1 coefficient goes into the denominator. Okay, let us simply go on. The next Feynman rule is for the quartic interaction and in the reference theory it is simply minus I lambda reference. But in the general theory it is different. First of all we have the L to the 4 term over there but uh, and that gives minus I times lambda without index. But then we have the C2 term. The C2 term also contributes to this Feynman rule and uh, it involves a derivative. The derivative gets converted in, so D'Alembert gets converted into minus P square of the incoming momenta. And according to symmetry, we need to sum over all the four minus P squares for the four incoming momenta. And due to symmetry, we also get three factorial. So we get times three factorial times C2 times the sum of I goes to from one to four. Um, pi square and, oh, oh, sorry, plus, times the usual factor i for each Feynman rule. So here there is a plus. Okay, so there, the Feynman diagram is much more complicated and it is now momentum dependent, um, whereas in the reference theory it is momentum independent. Then we have the vertex with six external legs. In the first theory, this is simply minus i times six factorial C1 reference. In the other case, it is minus i six factorial times C1 without an index. That is um, equally simple. And then we have the term with C3. The term with C3 gives us a Feynman rule in the exercise, you almost didn't believe it, but it is a Feynman rule with just two external legs. And just to make it uh, look different, let me use a square here to denote this C3 Feynman rule. It is a bilinear vertex with two external lines and some incoming momentum P. And the Feynman rule, according to the usual um, rule, D'Alembert gives minus p square, D'Alembert square gives plus p to the fourth power, and uh, we have a symmetry factor, so we simply get minus two times i c3 p to the fourth power. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, so, and this applies only to the general case, so in the other it is zero, and here we have minus two i c3 p to the fourth power. Okay, now this um, describes the two versions of the theory, the simplest one and the most general one. 
with either three or six free parameters. And uh, here the Feynman rules are obviously excessively complicated. And now let me explain to you how we can calculate physical observables from both theories. And um, obviously the result is going to be the same. The calculation here is way more complicated. And uh, so in principle it would not be necessary to do it but uh, that should come out as a result and as a lesson of the exercise because I want you to note that there is this redundancy and later on, since you will then know that the redundancy exists, you have the opportunity to simplify your theory before doing calculations. You would then in practice see this Lagrangian and remember, oops, there was this opportunity to simplify the Lagrangian in a certain way, which we are now learning. And therefore, before using those Feynman rules, you apply equations of motion, and you go here and then do the calculation of the observables. That is exactly the point. But the second reason why I want you to follow me a little bit and look at the details of the calculation is that if you have loop calculations, then the loop calculations will lead to expressions which have all these properties. So loop calculations involve, for example, so-called self-energies. They can behave like this. Loop calculations involve corrections to such a vertex, and uh, the loop corrections will have such a behavior, even though even, uh, it is just even more complicated than this, of course. So if you understand how to compute observables from this theory, you will also understand a few important lessons how to extract observables from a loop calculation. Because these details that we are now going to see regarding LSC reduction and extracting S matrix elements and so on, they have to be repeated for loop calculations as well. So therefore, this has multiple uh, reasons for being useful. And so let us now embark, let us embark on the computation of observables. So for the observables, the first thing is you need the full propagator. including loops or including higher order corrections. And uh, then it is often not called propagator, but the two point function. We need the two point function. And what is the full uh, propagator, including higher order corrections or including corrections at all here? So this is the three level propagator Feynman rule, but this is not the only Feynman diagram we need to consider for a two point function. Why not? because of this vertex here. So this now contributes, and so there is a Feynman diagram that looks like this. Okay, and we simply need to add the Feynman diagrams. There is a third diagram that looks like that. And so on. The number of Feynman diagrams which contribute is infinite infinitely many three-level diagrams. And uh, the character of the diagrams is such that this is a geometric series. So here we have one propagator and here we always have the same propagator and then multiply it with this block, then with a block squared, with a block cubed and so on. So we literally get a geometric series. And uh, in the notes, you can see it in more details, and the result is simply this structure. Uh, the original propagator, a1 p square minus a1 m tilde square, and then the Feynman rule here goes into the denominator, minus 2 c3 p to the fourth. So we have this structure in our propagator. Now, what is the physical meaning of such a propagator? And uh, I'm not sure whether you did this in QFT1 lectures. Uh, we did it a few times, but not always. But let me now drop the result. So the first important 
um, physical meaning of this propagator is the physical mass. The physical mass of a particle is the eigenvalue of the p-square operator, and the eigenvalue of the p-square operator corresponds to the location of the pole of this two-point function. So this two-point function has a denominator. The denominator can go to zero. That corresponds to a pole in the variable p-square, and the location of the pole is always equal to the physical mass of the particle described by the theory. So let's give it a name, m physical square. And if you work out what that is, the pole is not at the variable m tilde. So m tilde is not the physical mass. m tilde is the mass parameter of the Lagrangian. But you will see here that the mass parameter of the Lagrangian does not need to coincide with the physical mass described by the overall theory because of interactions. And so uh, the physical mass is not equal to m square, but it is given by m square plus a correction, namely plus 2c3 over a1 times m tilde to the fourth power. That is the location of the pole in the variable p square. You can check it, and therefore this is the physical mass. Uh, a key word that you can look up for this relationship is the so-called Tellin-Lehmann representation. So for example, we did all of that in our quantum field theory lecture 2019, which is on YouTube. But of course, this is standard. And in uh, the reference theory, what is the pole in the reference theory? In the reference theory, this is just M reference. So because there is no interaction there. So that would be equal to m reference square. And if we want to say that uh, there is any chance that the theories describe the same physics, then the first thing which must be equal is the physical mass of the particle. And therefore, we must identify m reference square with this expression. We cannot identify m reference square with m tilde square, but with this polynomial. Otherwise, the physics is going to be different. Then the next important thing from the propagator is the residue. The pole corresponds to the physical mass. And at the location of the pole, the propagator now has some residue, forgetting about the i. And the residue is obviously non-trivial. So let's calculate the residue at the pole. And the name of this is curly Z, curly capital Z, and uh, it turns out to be 1 over A1 minus 4 C3 M tilde square. And of course, in the reference case, the residue is simply 1. So you will see in a second why we need the residue. But so much for the propagator. B, let us calculate further observables. Let us calculate first a scattering with four light particles. And according to the LSE reduction formalism, there is a recipe how to compute a physical S matrix element or scattering amplitude uh, or the so-called T matrix element for this process. Uh, namely, you have the following recipe. You calculate the amputated green function. with four external legs. So these are basically the Feynman diagrams for the process here at three level. Uh, but after you calculate the Feynman diagrams without external lines, see so the external lines are dropped. That is the meaning of amputated. But after amputating it, you multiply with this square root of z for each external line 
as a normalization. That uh, makes the normalization physical. Otherwise, uh, the normalization is undefined. Um, and uh, you cannot interpret this as a physical scattering amplitude, but this provides the correct normalization factor, and that is why we calculated the residue of the pole before. And why we need that, that is the proof of the LSE reduction theorem for the S matrix. So here, in this case, what are the Feynman diagrams for the 2 to 2 process? How many Feynman diagrams are there for 2 to 2 scattering? Yes, so in this list it would be just one Feynman rule because we have combined it. But indeed, so there is only this Feynman diagram. And the external legs are not part of the diagram, so the diagram is literally given by the factor that we see in the list over there. And then we multiply with this. So therefore, in the reference theory, this is equal simply to minus i lambda reference, okay? Because that is the Feynman rule and the C is one. Therefore, that is the result for the physical scattering matrix element, as simple as that. However, in the general theory, it now becomes ugly. So in the general theory, first of all, we have a momentum dependence in the vertex but the momentum dependence actually simplifies because the p-square of all the external lines are now equal. So pi-square, they are set equal to what? They are set equal to the mass of the particle, but which mass? The physical mass. Because the physical particles which appear in the scattering, they have momentum which is equal to the physical mass and that is why we needed to compute the physical mass. So we will plug that result for the physical mass into the pi square in the Feynman rule over there. Then we have an expression for the diagram which contains over there four times the physical mass square. Then we multiply with uh, the second power of this. We expand up to first order in the coefficients c, and we obtain the following expression. Minus i lambda divided by a1 square, minus 8i lambda c3 m tilde square divided by a1 cube, plus 24i c2 m tilde square divided by a1 square. Okay? So, after some ugly calculation, this is what you get. Three terms which depend on the coefficients C3 and C2 and also on the m tilde square, the mass parameter, but not the physical mass. Okay, so likewise, let's go to the even more complicated case, namely six particle scattering. And again, our physical S matrix element is given by the amputated green functions, which look like this. So all Feynman diagrams with this shape, but without external line corrections, multiplied with square root of Z for each external line, so square root of Z to the sixth power. Now, how many and which Feynman diagrams are there? So, which Feynman diagrams contribute to this process? There is now more than one, but the first one is uh, simply the direct C1 Feynman rule with six particles. So, this vertex appears, but of course it is not the only one. So we can do something with a quartic vertex and then we get Feynman diagrams with this typical shape. Okay. So we get this. Um, and we might even also consider 
such refinement diagram. And uh, then we need to plug in all the Feynman rules. Again, we set in the general theory the external momenta to the physical mass and uh, multiply with the square root of z and you can find the calculation in the notes. Let me just give you the result. So in the reference theory, we get uh, equal to minus i lambda reference times the sum over 10 different uh, index combinations of the indices i, j, k times 1 over p i, j, k square minus the reference mass squared minus 6 factorial times i times c1 reference. Okay. So here this comes obviously from the six point vertex and this comes from the diagram with the two lambda vertices uh, and here there is a square. And we have done similar calculations in the exercise. Now let me give you the result for the calculation in the general theory where we have um, here a more complicated Feynman rule. Here the Feynman rule becomes momentum dependent, of course. And uh, here we then have three external momenta, which we set equal to the physical mass square, and one internal momentum, which is this Pijk square. So then we get terms where the Pijk square is also in the numerator. Then we can make some manipulations and cancel the numerator Pijk square and get some additional terms. We also have to calculate this and multiply with the square root of z. And after some calculation, we obtain the following result. Namely, some long bracket times the same sum over ijk of 1 divided by Pijk square minus the physical mass square. So in the calculation, I deliberately replace everywhere uh, the m tilde by the physical mass such that the denominator structure here becomes equal. And in the uh, uh, curly bracket, we have the following, minus i lambda squared divided by a1 to the fourth power, minus i lambda squared C3 m tilde square divided by a1 to the fifth power times 16 plus i lambda C2 m tilde square divided by a1 to the fourth power times the prefactor 48. So this is the resulting prefactor in the general theory. And then we also have such a constant term without momentum dependence, which has the following form, minus i times c1 times this factorial divided by a1 cube plus lambda cube c3 divided by a1 to the fifth power times the prefactor 20 minus lambda c2 divided by a1 to the fourth power times the prefactor 120. Small fun comment, I struggled for a few hours with these prefactors here until I discovered that uh, the original prefactors that I had for some time uh, had to be multiplied with a factor 10 because they appear in the sum over 10 equal terms. Okay, and then uh, everything worked out uh, smoothly. Okay, um, very good. But that is the result. And so now, the moral of the story is that all the observables uh, that we are consider the physical mass, the physical scattering processes, with arbitrary external momenta, so these are infinitely many observables. It's not three observables, it's infinitely many observables because the momenta are all arbitrary, angles and so on. Um, they can be the same, 
regardless what you choose for the six parameters in the general theory, you can always find values for the three reference parameters such that the reference theory produces the same physical result. Therefore, the theory in truth has not six free parameters, but only three. So as a simple observation, for example, lambda always appears in this combination, lambda over A1 square. C3 always appears in this combination, C3 over A1. C2 similarly always appears in this combination, C2 over A1 square. So uh, the parameters do not appear in uh, arbitrary combinations, but only in specific combinations, and that is how uh, you see that some combinations of them are actually redundant and are not important to describe physics. So to sum it up, the result is if the reference theory parameters are chosen as the following, namely m reference square is equal to m tilde square plus 2 c3 over a1 m tilde to the fourth. Then the physical mass is equal. And similarly, lambda reference and c1 reference is equal to some particular combination which you find in my notes and which you can obviously see. So here you see the equality that you need for lambda. That must become lambda reference and something similar. So here the curly bracket must become C1 reference. Then all observables are equal. So there are redundant parameters in our general theory. And we have learned that the hard way by doing the explicit computation. But I remind you that doing the hard way is necessary if you have loops, where, for example, this uh, curly z, the residue of the propagator, is not equal to 1, then you need to do exactly that. If you have loop corrections to the propagator, which look like the square, that the square could become a loop, and then, of course, you need to calculate such loops and take them into account, and the calculation of them would be similar, have a similar effect. Let us continue with a discussion of field transformations, which was the fir third or final part of the exercise. We will now anal analyze um, basically the most general set of field transformations that we can apply onto our Lagrangian without changing the physics and uh, calculate the impact how the Lagrangian changes as a result of the field transformations. Then we know that we get a uh, family of physically equivalent Lagrangians, and we will see that one of them is such that you can transform the general Lagrangian directly into the reference Lagrangian. In other words, you can use the field transformations simply to eliminate three out of the six parameters. And that is what you would ultimately do in practice, of course, if you want to simplify your theory as much as possible. So, in the general Lagrangian, which is a functional of L, we apply the following field transformation. The field L becomes the most general polynomial of third order, or in other words, the most general nonlinear expression, which is compatible with a discrete symmetry and which involves uh, or which generates terms up to dimension six in the Lagrangian. Everything else is unnecessary for us. So the most general structure of that kind would be a, a linear term with an arbitrary coefficient plus a term B1 times a dimension three operator, 
which has the same symmetry property, is linear, uh, namely d'Alembert L prime plus B2 times L prime cube. So these are the three only expressions of up to dimension three, which have the same discrete symmetry property as the original L, and uh, for simplicity, drop the prime. So we will not distinguish any more L prime and L. So this gives effective, the, this simply changes the coefficients in this L general. So the L general was already the most general Lagrangian that contains uh, all possible operators up to dimension six. If we apply this most general field transformation, nothing new can uh, appear. There are no new structures. All the structures which appear have already been there before, so only the coefficients change. Therefore, we can write uh, the changes as following, namely C2, uh, sorry, um, actually let me not write down the general thing, but uh, let me draw one more conclusion. So we can then show using uh, the result that we had before, the explicit calculation of the observables that uh, the observables remain equal. So in other words, that can be explicitly verified. Um, and uh, therefore, we can use the field transformation to simplify the Lagrangian. Can use field transformations to simplify L general without changing physics. Okay, so once we know that the field transformations do not change physics, we can use them to simplify the Lagrangian. And one way we can do is we can apply field transformations. So uh, using now the result of how the coefficients change uh, in terms of this, we can make it such that C3 changes to zero. So from ever C3 was before, we now calculate square root z, b1, b2, such that after the field transformation, C3 becomes zero. Similarly, we can do it such that C2, after applying this, becomes zero. Similarly, we can do it such that the coefficient a1, this kinetic term coefficient, becomes simply equal to one. We can do all that, and uh, if we require these three conditions, then uh, those coefficients z, b1, b2, they are fixed. So you will look at the explicit for expression for how C3 changes, then this condition gives you some equation how to determine these three quantities. Second equation, third equation, so from the three equations, you know exactly how the three coefficients in the field transformation have to look like. Okay, so then the field transformation is fixed. Since it is fixed, you can then plug in the fixed transformation into the other coefficients, C1, uh, A1, M tilde, or M tilde square, and uh, lambda. So they also change, and they change in a way which is now calculable, and let me just copy how they change, and you can see the calculation in the notes. C1 becomes C1 over A1 cube, plus lambda C3, lambda square C3 over A1 to the fifth power times one over 36, minus lambda C2 over A1 to the fourth power times one over six. Similarly, um, M tilde square becomes m tilde square plus two m tilde to the fourth power times c three 
over A1. And lambda changes to lambda divided by A1 square plus lambda C3 M tilde square divided by A1 cube times the prefactor 8 minus C2 M tilde square divided by A1 square times the prefactor 24. So this is the outcome. You now know that you do not change the physics if you change the six coefficients in this way according to the field transformation. And uh, lo and behold, you observe something beautiful, namely this change is exactly the same as that change over here. Namely, so looking at the simplest, m tilde square becomes exactly this polynomial. That is exactly the same as the relationship to this reference mass square. And uh, similarly, for lambda and C1, it is exactly the same, including this strange coefficients 20 and 120. That comes because you need to divide them by 6 factorial. 6 factorial is 720. And therefore, 120 divided by 6 factorial is 1 over 6. 20 divided by 6 factorial is 1 over 36. And that explains these coefficients here. So um, the summary of the discussion is the general theory becomes the reference theory, the parameter relations are as in our calculation two here. This ends the discussion of our exercise number four. So you see again that we have studied the ambiguity of the Lagrangian of the EFT in two different ways. We worked through the hard way of calculating all the observables using the general Feynman rules with momentum dependent vertices and a strange propagator. But it worked out and we obtained uh, that the reference theory describes the same physics if we have certain parameter identifications. Then we applied field transformations uh, which do not change the physics and we see that using them we can immediately transform the general Lagrangian into the one of the reference theory by applying specific coefficients in the field transformations. So again, everything works out beautifully and we have two different ways of analyzing the same thing, namely this ambiguity. And uh, so from now on, you have this uh, explicit experience and you know that uh, such field equations or um, field transformations can be used to simplify the Lagrangian of the EFT. And just to make sure once again, physics doesn't change S metrics do not change and the physical masses do not change, but what changes are uh, arbitrary Feynman diagrams for off-shell green functions with arbitrary off-shell momenta. Those are not directly physical observables, but the actual physical S matrix elements, they remain the same. Any questions? Yep. Yep. of the Lagrangian. And can this discussion be, because normally we say for the fundamental theories, not for the EFTs, but we find the most, the easiest Lagrangian, which is Lorentz invariant and which is gauge invariant. Mm. Can be, this discussion be, be as a, can that be explained in the same ways as here? Why we find, why we find the easiest one and that should be the one Mm. I'm not sure I fully understand uh, what you have in mind. 
gauge invariance doesn't play a role here, but gauge invariance could be studied in a similar way. Of course, it is a little bit more involved. And uh, for example, we might wonder whether um, the Lagrangian of an EFT is also gauge invariant or whether it has uh, non-gauge invariant vertices and terms in the Lagrangian, and we will come to that. Um, but um, on the other hand, um, yes, it is important that we are able to simplify the Lagrangian in order to exhibit really the physical essence of the theory. Um, however, it is also sometimes really interesting to study those more general Lagrangians because you might be actually interested in describing not only the same physics as your fundamental theory, but you might want to actually describe the same off-shell green functions as well. Uh, sometimes that is also necessary and then you must work with this more general Lagrangian. So there are applications of both approaches. I don't know whether this fully answers the question. So are there other questions or further discussions? Yeah. So these are the four lessons or two times two lessons that we drew from uh, the previous discussions from the previous weeks. Effective field theories seem to exist and uh, they are ambiguous. So let us now go on with the lecture. Let us discuss reasons and explanations. So I deliberately gave you lots of calculational examples to give you practice and to uh, have you make uh, your own observations. And we have seen the lessons, effective field theories can exist and can describe the same physics and the same results of Feynman diagrams as full theories. But I have not yet given you the general proof why that is the case. We have just observed it in several examples. Similarly, we have now uh, clearly stated that field transformations can be applied to the Lagrangian without changing the physics. We have observed it to be true. Um, but why is this actually the case that uh, we have also not discussed? And so let me now uh, explain both to give you a general argument why these effective field theories exist and why they have the form that we have uh, observed in our explicit calculations. And uh, in order to do that, we work with a path integral. So for the path integral, we can represent green functions which correspond to arbitrary Feynman diagrams using the path integral. So this would be a green function, time ordered product of some field operators. Uh, the path integral uh, expression for this is a path integral over all field configurations of the theory. So we have light fields and heavy fields. So we integrate over all field configurations of both. Then we have here the classical counterpart of those operators times e to the i times the action. So in the full theory, we have a path integral where we have an exponential with i times the full action, uh, the space-time integral, over the full Lagrangian of the full theory. And the full Lagrangian, of course, depends on the light and the heavy field. That is our path integral expression. And now comes the explanation why the effective field theory exists and at the same time, why do we call it integrating out a heavy particle? Because that's exactly what we will now do. We simply carry out the integration over the heavy field, that's all. So we carry out this integration. And uh, so if we then simply go on with our calculation, what happens is the following. We get, as a result, a path integral only over the light fields. Then these uh, L functions, they do not change by the integration over the heavy fields, so these factors just remain here. And then what we get is the result of the integral over the heavy field of just the exponential. Exponential of e to the i times the action, including h 
we integrate over h. And what is the result? The result is simply some functional of the light field. It cannot depend anymore on the heavy field, but it must, of course, depend on the light field since this depends on both. So let us just give it a name. And the name I will give it is W subscript H of L. So let's call the result by definition E to the I times W H of L. And this W H of L is some functional of L, but not of capital H. And this corresponds to the jargon that we have integrated out the heavy field H. So as simple as that, in that sense, we have already proven that an effective field theory exists and the action of the effective field theory is simply this WH. However, what we have not yet established is that this action WH of L, whether it has the form of a normal action that we know in quantum field theory, namely an integral over a Lagrangian density, where the Lagrangian density is actually local. Not every func uh, functional uh, is a space-time integral over a local Lagrangian density. And second and more in detail, uh, we have observed that we can obtain the uh, action by using the equation of motion trick. And therefore, let us prove now why the equation of motion trick works in getting this WH of L. And that is specific to tree level. So at tree level, Tree level means we work at a classical limit because loops are of uh, the order h bar. Therefore, uh, if we neglect loops, it means we neglect corrections of the order h bar, and that means we work at a classical limit. So if we work at a classical limit, we have to evaluate the path integral in the uh, classical limit, and we know what that means. Namely, then in the path integral, not every path contributes, but only the classical path contributes, which corresponds to the stationary point. Um, in other words, to the solution of the equation of motion. So only um, the classical path contributes in this dh integral. And therefore, we immediately obtain the result wh of l. Um, so it's obtained by the integration over all field configurations. And uh, the classical limit means that the integral collapses to one term namely to the term where here we replace the H by its stationary point by its solution to the equation of motion. So we get this is the full action where we replace H by its solution to its classical equation of motion. And that explains the existence of the EFT and the equation of motion procedure. So that is compatible with all our explicit calculations, but now you see the general reason why it will work in all cases and uh, why what we have done is generally correct. Any questions? So it is really as simple as this. However, 
we will have to come back to similar discussions when we work at the loop level, because obviously we have made here the classical approximation. And uh, if we work at the loop level, um, these steps here are of course different. And also, we will then have to be a little bit more careful here um, about integrating just over H and uh, doing nothing to the L integral. So we will have another look at the whole discussion here. But for the tree level situation, it is correct and it is in agreement with our explicit computations. So therefore, take this as a kind of uh, preliminary or first sketch of the way to look at this whole procedure. And we will do similar discussions with a higher level of fine details uh, later on. So, okay. Uh, we can do similar discussions for the ambiguities. Um, we have only five minutes of time, so do you have more questions? Otherwise, I would start saying a few words on the ambiguities from a similar perspective. No questions. Okay, then let me continue. So about the ambiguities. Looking at the path integral, clearly the physics cannot depend on the variable choice in the path integral. Therefore, the physics and observables cannot change under path integral variable substitutions. And again, this uh, statement is a little bit sketchy, but um, let's uh, for now work on this uh, sketchy level. So if we do uh, variable L goes to L plus a small variation, so co let's call it delta L, and then this would be some functional, like we just had in the case with B1 plus B2, where we had here d'Alembert L and L cube, and uh, something like this. Then the path integral measure dL is invariant. So, and let's do a footnote of this later on. But the path integral measure is invariant under such a substitution. And um, second, the action, the Lagrangian over some field changes into Lagrangian of L plus delta L, which you can write as the Lagrangian of the original L plus some variation of the Lagrangian. So this field transformation generates additional small terms of order of this variation, delta L, which is assumed to be small as well, um, in the Lagrangian. So therefore, if we look at the path integral before and after the field transformation, the measure is the same, and the Lagrangian changes by delta L, so it simply means uh, the original path integral with the original Lagrangian and the modified path integral with the additional delta L describe the same physics. And therefore, it basically means you can change the Lagrangian from the original L to this L plus delta L. The physics will stay the same and the delta L is obtained by applying such a field transformation onto the original Lagrangian. So, let's write this down, L and L plus delta L describe the same physics. And this obviously explains our observations on redundancy. 
which was this exercise 2.4, the second part that we discussed before, and the equality to field transformations. which was the exercise 2.4, the third part. Okay. So again, a very simple, very simple um, observation in the path integral immediately shows you why these field transformations can be applied and why they do not change the physics since they simply correspond to a variable substitution in the path integral. As simple as that. So let me uh, make the footnote explicit and then we stop and next time we will start with a summary of the whole section and then we begin with section two of the lecture. So just a note on this uh, footnote here. Um, this um, fact that the path integral measure is invariant is an exact statement in uh, including loops in dimensional regularization. where it has a special name, namely regularized quantum action principle. And uh, as a reference, we have proved uh, this in two different lectures, so I just re refer to them. So we'll see there was a multi-loop lecture or the quantum field theory 2 lecture section 186. So there we uh, made exactly this statement and proved it explicitly. So it's an all order statement valid in a specific scheme, namely the dimensional regularization scheme which we will mostly use. And uh, therefore, um, this part is not a sketch. It is uh, exactly true. And so we can uh, use that to establish the validity of these field uh, equivalences. All right, so much for that. Then let us continue on Thursday with a small summary of uh, our section one and then continue with section two of the lecture. So see you then.